This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. This is going to be a fun episode. This is where I actually talk with my father, fingerstyle jazz guitarist Martin Taylor, about touring, teaching guitar online, and much, much more. We talk about his worst moment in his music career, but also his musical light bulb moment, what happened when he was eight years old that changed everything for him. So enjoy this episode. Hey, it's James Taylor here, and this is a slightly different episode. Uh, this is a slightly different guest um, because this is a gentleman I've known ever since I was born. Um, uh, and uh, this was an idea that was, someone said to me the other day, I was talking about bringing on different guests and who they might like to hear as guests. And and one of the people that they said is Martin Taylor, who is my father, very, very well known in the world of jazz guitar, has worked with everyone from Stefan Grappelli and uh, Yehudi Menuhin, uh, Tommy Emmanuel, Jeff Beck, the list goes on and on and on. So this is a slightly unusual one because I am a son interviewing a father, but I hope you find this uh, this episode useful. Uh, we'll probably go into some some interesting areas with it as well. So, first of all, Martin, Dad, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, <laughs> first of all, go easy on me. <laughs> <laughs> so, first of all, sh- share with the listeners what what's going on in your world. What have you been working on? Well, I've been doing a lot of touring as usual, um, but I, I've also been been doing these guitar retreats. So I've um, they're they're really kind of learning holidays for for guitar players, and what we do we go to really nice parts of the world or interesting uh, places um, that maybe they wouldn't necessarily go to, or maybe they've they've had ambitions to go and spend some time there, and um, we we spend the day um, playing guitars and. I I give lessons. I have another teacher with me who who teaches as well. And <clears throat> so far, we've we've done done them in uh, the very first one we did was actually in in Shetland. And then we did uh, we did one in California, which has become an annual thing. And um, the Catskills in in upstate New York. And I've just done two in Italy. So this is all very new uh, for me because um, five and a half years ago um, I started my online interactive guitar school so um up until that point i'd never taught before and it was something i always remember my great guitar mentor ike isaacs said to me you know you know one day you'll you'll reach a point where you'll want to teach and i feel that i learned so much for him so much of what i do came from him that you know it's ridiculous it would be very selfish of me to uh, for that to stop here so it's now my turn to just to, to pass on the baton, as it were, and I do that through teaching. To, pa- to pass on to that that next generation of of players, and and in a minute we'll get into a little bit more depth about the the teaching side and the online teaching side, and also the the retreats. But talk to us about what what your first hour of your day looks like. Oh well, it varies depending if I'm at home or if I'm on on tour. It seems like I have two different lives. And it's always been like that. Well, all of my adult life has has been like that. It's been the, as you'll know yourself, uh, uh, as you know, I would come home to to family, and uh, th- that would be one kind of uh, routine. And then being on the road, which is basically getting up very early in the morning, traveling all day to get to the the, the next gig. Um, but w- certainly when I'm at home, and I try to do this when I'm I'm on the road as well, but it doesn't always work. But when I'm at home. I like to get up as early as possible without actually torturing myself. And I, I get up, I take a shower, and then I have a, a room in my house, a meditation room, and I go in there and I meditate for uh, an hour, hour and a half. And because that, that's that's something that's been very central for me for for a long time, kind of on and off. I you know it's something that I've been very. Um, um, it's been very central to my life. Then other times where it's kind of gone on the back burner a little, but certainly in the within the past ten years, it's been absolutely central. I figure if I can do that, um, then I can do all the other stuff. But I can't do the other stuff without actually centering myself and and um, getting into that that space. 
So we, I had a, another guest on recently. We were talking about that's that point of, especially if you've been on the road for a couple of weeks or even a couple of months, about coming then back off of the, off off the road back into you know, the home life and family life and and you know the, a more kind of maybe mundane way of, of of kind of doing things. And he he mentioned a word that I think an actor friend had told him who who does a lot of films and and, and he called it it's a process of reentry. Uh, mm. It's a process of you know because you, you're in a maybe a bubble or you're living in a certain type of way when you're on the road. Um, how how have you managed to to kind of have those two worlds work, or do you, do you have to, a, a process of kind of get getting back into things when you get home, and or, or maybe a different process where where you're about to go on the road, maybe for a longer period of time, and kind of like prepping yourself for for, for that that tour. Well. Um... The, the first thing is I always look forward to coming home. And so that's, you know, it, I do near the end of a, a tour when it's getting close, I start thinking about, oh, it'd be really nice to get, get back as much as I'm enjoying myself. And I, I don't tend to go on long tours anymore like I used to. Um, so there's there's always that anticipation where uh, looking forward to coming home. But I remember when, uh, you know, when when you and uh, your brother Stuart were, 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 were very little and if I went away for two months or longer, two or three months on, on a tour of America that I sometimes used to do with Stefan Grappelli, I would come back and you'd all gone on with your lives and you're all, all, uh, all doing your own thing and, you know, your brother Stuart, he would, you know, he'd have his ponies and your mum was, was involved in, uh, you know, taking him to horse shows and you were involved in, in, in your music and things that you were doing at school. And uh, I would come home and, oh, you know, it's... <laughs> <laughs> try and find a, a way of fitting in yeah. uh, with what was going on. And it did used to occur to me when, uh, something I never did, but it did occur to me at one point that when I, if I was on a long tour, I should actually, before going home, um, just go and stay in a hotel for a couple of nights <laughs> as, as like a, a decompression yeah. check. Yeah, um, that did. I never did it. I never got, because I was too keen to, anxious to get home. But there were times when I when I got back, or oh, you know, I should have really have gone into the decompression thing, <laughs> or or we should have met. Actually, that that's happened before. You may re- remember that was happened a few times in your childhood when uh, we would finish a tour. We usually finished our started tours on the east coast and ended up on the west coast, and usually we ended up in San Francisco, and um, all the family would would come out for that, and then we'd have a few days at the end. That was a good way way of doing it. But no, I I adjust very quickly. Actually, when I when I'm going away, for instance, I, tomorrow I'm I'm going to Norway, and uh, so I've got to kind of get myself together. But it's only a short trip. I'm only doing one one concert. Um, but I always have this thing in my mind: Oh, do I have to go? <laughs> but once once I'm actually everything's packed and I'm and I'm gone, I'm just completely in into that world, and it's a world that I know so well. Um, it doesn't bother me. But I used to be like that as well, going on stage. I used to stand in the wings. And as as time got closer to actually going on stage, I should think to myself, wouldn't it be great if um, you know there was uh, there was a problem? And they said the show can't go on. <laughs> I, actually, I, I used to, you know, I, used to, I when it got close to actually going on stage, I didn't want to do it. Yeah, not not out of nerves. Well, maybe it was. I don't know. I, I certainly didn't feel nervous, but I I said, oh, it'd be nice. If I could just go back to the hotel and have dinner. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting, I suppose, that with, with also with technology and with with Skype and with Facebook and with WhatsApp and with everything else, that the you know the, probably the, the generation now whose uh, parents are on the road, they're touring and they're they're staying at home. There's there's probably mu- they're probably speaking with each other. It's much simpler for them to be speaking with each other all the time and having conversations. And I know you know uh, bass players are in kind of big bands and they're, they're, they're touring and you know they're speaking almost every every other day by Skype, which you which would have been you know very difficult yeah. to have phone calls every even every well, couple of days I, in the, when you're I, touring. I think I think a lot of families and, and friends probably talk to each other more now than they ever did. Mm. Um, even if they're only down the road or even in the same building, you know, they're, they're doing it by, um, uh, you know, going on, on Facebook and um, somewhat, uh, you know, a relative in the next room actually put, puts a like or a comment up, yeah. you know, even something like that. But, yeah, when I first went on the road, I mean, it was very different. I mean, it was in the, in the early 70s and 
being on the road in the UK was pretty horrendous actually because you know we just stay in bed and breakfast and boarding houses and uh, and things and uh, there was you go back you know everywhere closed everywhere was closed except that time when we were on stage then you know restaurants and there weren't you know once you once you got out into the the, the provinces there weren't you know there, there were few and far between uh, um, so nowhere was, you couldn't go and eat before the gig because they hadn't opened yet and then after the gig everything was was shut and then you'd end up going back to a, a bed and breakfast that didn't have television mm. in it or didn't have any anything you know so um it was it, and the food was terrible <laughs> <laughs> How, how, absolutely how, how, how times have changed and what would you say is your, your, your biggest uh weakness as a as a music artist and as a, as a creative creative person uh, i think probably without a doubt my biggest weakness and it goes across the board in everything i do is that i'm not very good at time management and organizing i like things to be organized and it's like I like things to be neat and tidy, but I'm not actually very good at it. Mm -hmm. So I have to work very hard at, at doing that. But probably time management, I can waste a lot of time um, just by getting sidetracked onto something else. And uh, so I, you know, I look at people that are very good at that, and you, you are a, a shining example, I have to say, even though you're my son. But uh, you, you obviously must get that from your mother and not from, from <laughs> me uh, because um, – I've never been. I never have been good at time time management, and it's something I try to do, particularly now. Now that we have, you know, we have smartphones, so I try to put things into the phone mm -hmm. um, to try and organize each day. Because so often, when I'm at home now, I'm, I'm just sitting in my my studio at home, and um, I got up my usual uh, this morning at uh, actually about half past six did my usual meditation and then I had to go out and do a few things and I thought well, I'll come back and I've got to film some things for my studio my, my students I suddenly suddenly looked at the uh, at my watch and it's four o'clock in the afternoon mm. and um, I, I often think you know did I use my time uh, did I use my time properly but then it, it is good sometimes just to it's good to daydream sometimes and not actually be creative. <laughs> and, and what about on the flip side? What would you say is your, your biggest strength? Uh, oh, my biggest strength. Uh, um, poss uh, possibly my, my creativity as a musician uh, is a strength uh, I have. I don't know. I think it might be other people. You might even be able to answer that better than me. And on, on the creative, is, is that something you've always felt quite strongly about, or is it something that's that's kind of evolved over the years? Uh, no, it's just that? it's just something that happened. Mm. The reason I got into music was because it was how I thought. So um, when I look back at it, and I and I think for so many years, my early days, I still do it now. I really thought in music. I didn't think so much in words. Um, I, I thought in, um, in sounds. And so the reason I got into playing music is a lot of musicians I know, they started music as a hobby. Mm -hmm. Well, music never has been a hobby for me. Um, it's, it's, it was how I understood life. Um, it, because I really understood that, you know, I went to school and, and the teachers would get up and talk about all kinds of subjects. I didn't have a clue what they were talking about. Uh, but I understood music. So that's that was my connection with understanding um, my place in the world and everything uh, uh, around me was really from from sound, and so I you know always say that really music was my was my first language, and I I meet a lot of guitar players that don't play professionally and some some of my students and I had one say to me recently he said you know it must be really good for you because. Um, he was telling me that he works in a bank, and then in, at night uh, he comes home and he sits for in his room for for a couple of hours just playing the guitar. And he said it's great because he can switch off when he picks the guitar up. So he said, "So it must be the same for you." And I said, "Absolutely not. It's the complete reverse for me. Mm. If I pick the guitar up, I switch on. So I never, I never ever play music either myself, play music or listen to music if I want to Relax. switch off." Yeah. Because it's it's part of my – it's the language that goes on in my head. As soon as I hear music or start playing music, I start to create. Yeah. So, you know, I'm starting to, to work. 
<laughs> and I think that's probably you know it's probably the same same for me having been in in this business, but maybe from the other side, from more the the business side, I I would I would struggle probably to go to a concert without thinking working out what the the net revenue of the audience is <laughs> and without thinking like well the sound the production engineer is not quite in the right position there and lighting's not quite right there and it's so mm. that that's probably not it's that's probably not the most relaxing place for me to go if I if I'd want to unwind to go to another concert. Well, as a musician, I I taught myself something because I would go to places where there was music going on, either live music or you know maybe just music in the background in a restaurant. And like a lot of musicians, it used to drive me completely nuts mm. because very often it was music I didn't want to hear. I felt it was an intrusion. And and then if I went somewhere there where there was a band playing and they weren't very good, I, you know it it hurt it hurt me because I was I was getting into I was focusing really honing in when i listen to music i get right into the right into the middle of it yeah and you know if you you go somewhere and there's a band and they're, they're doing their best and they're very keen but it's not very good it starts to hurt after mm -hmm. a while so i trained myself to listen as a musician which i which is my natural instinct but i also trained myself to listen as somebody that isn't a musician mm -hmm. so i can actually just i can just switch from being a musician to being a, not a musician, depending on the situation I'm in. That's why, you know, I can go to, to a place and I can, I can be in a place being bombarded with some horrendous music. <laughs> it, it doesn't actually bother me. And I'm, I, th that's a bit of a rare breed among yeah. musicians. But, but I worked very hard at that. So I can actually, I can just... Also, if, if somebody that isn't a musician, they say to me, this is the greatest piece of music I've ever heard this is the greatest singer, the greatest guitar player I've ever heard, and I listen to it, and I know it's not very good. But then I, it fascinated me. I, I wonder what they're hearing that I'm not hearing. Mm. I didn't feel superior to them. I'm, I'm a musician. You know, I've got, I've, I've got 200 doctorates in music. I've got, I've got a, a, a Grammy nomination. I've got this. I know my stuff. I don't do that at all. I just think, what are they hearing that I can't hear? And... So I then I switch off my musician's ears and put on my kind of layperson's ears and listen to it, and I get it. I and also I think to myself, what is it that people don't like about jazz? If I switch off my jazz musician ears and put on my other ears, I can hear exactly what it is they don't like about it. Because you know, with, with jazz, you have it's improvised music, and in a group, everyone is they've got this interaction going on. So there's a lot going on. Mm. Has a hell of a lot going on in diff going in different directions, and it's unpredictable. And if when I switch my musician's ears off and I listen to that, yeah, I can I can see exactly, I can hear exactly why people don't like it, because it just sounds like a cacophony. <laughs> and, and and here's a tip for any of the listeners: uh, if you're touring in the UK, that the Martin and I we, we we know about this. There's a little trick in in the industry, but a lot of tour managers go and buy this uh, book. It's a guide. It's called the, uh, the the quiet pint and it's a, a list of all the the pubs i think in restaurants in the uk that don't have uh, background music and piped music and like pinball machines and things as well and i know it's a it's a favorite of a lot of tour managers because the, often the last thing that musicians want to do is when they're on tour and if they have to stop for lunch somewhere is to go into a place that's playing um uh, Celine Dion, but uh, nothing wrong with Celine Dion, I suppose. But just might not be what you want to hear when you're you're, you're having uh, you're having lunch. So, talk to me about a time when you um, you worked on something, you, you were working on a project, and you were kind of giving it your all, and for whatever reason, it didn't work out. But more importantly, what was the the lesson that you learned from that experience? Well, I can't think of one specific. Uh, occasion, or certain, certainly, I can't think of one big occasion that happened, but that does happen occasionally. Well, I'll have a, a, a fantastic idea about something. Sometimes I wake up in the morning and I have a great idea, or in the middle of the night, uh, and I have this great idea, and it's fantastic. But then, as I start working it through, I realise that it's absolute rubbish, and <laughs> it's just not going to work at all or for whatever reason it could be a number of reasons either it's actually not actually not a good idea um maybe it's been done before far better than i could ever do it um it can can be can be many reasons um and then you just you just drop you just drop it and move on mm. that's really what it is because you know we think about 
Um, I certainly don't look at look at that happen when that happens as being a failure. Um, I think uh, life generally is as each day, every single day is just a, a series of failures and successes, depending on, on what it is. You know, you might um, you might make a cup of tea and it's um, you know, you use the wrong tea bags. It's, yeah. It didn't, didn't taste very good. That's that's a little failure, isn't it? So you throw it down the sink and you, you make yourself an amazing espresso, <laughs> and that's a success. You know, we have these little, and it's it's just a matter of always moving on, always knowing that uh, although we we have to kind of we we must always live in the present moment, but uh, everything changes. And you can't be, you cannot be stuck in, in a, you, you just cannot be stuck with something. It doesn't work. That didn't happen. All right. Okay. Now let's move on. Or even when you have success, the same thing too there. You can't just keep gr- grabbing onto that and saying, oh, I, in 1987, I did this. And then keep reminding everybody on your gigs about the, the, this thing you did in 1987. Yeah. Move on. Other things, other things happened. That, that happened then. That was it. And have there been kind of aha moments or the kind of light bulb moments in in your life and your journey to to making it in, in music and that, having this this career in music that you can recollect times when you know that that light bulb's gone and gone on and and it's and it's had a it's had an effect it's made you think differently about the the path you were on or maybe the the way that you were you were you were trying to build out a career in music. Yeah, I think there's been quite a few. Um, the first one that I can really no, actually, it's probably not the first one. Actually, the, probably the first one was when I was about, uh, I was about eight years old, and a, a music shop opened near us. It was actually they actually sold um, sewing machines and and uh, knitting wool and all that kind of knitting needles. But the guy that that ran it knew there was there wasn't a music shop in the town, and he decided to buy some musical instrument get some musical instruments in and it sort of it it sort of became a, a, a music shop you still had you still had women coming in and buying uh, their 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 wool for knitting and uh, and and you know that kind of thing but at the same time there'd be somebody sitting on a fender twin uh, <laughs> in, in the guitar it was quite a funny place um and i i can remember sitting with going home um from there and sitting with my dad your grandfather and just playing something for him that I'd heard, and he he thought that was great. So because you know, it, it it actually came very easy to me. In fact, you could hear something and and then then play it. Yeah, because I heard so I heard a, a recording of it and I just played it. And I, I I always tell everybody the only thing that has come easy to me in my life is playing the guitar. And mm. um, everything else has been very very difficult, uh, or or it hasn't. You know, I've had to work a lot harder at it, or or failed miserably. Uh, but playing the guitar, just one thing that you know, playing music, I understood, and it came very easy to me. And I think my dad had friends that uh, that played music. Some of them did play professionally, and um, so I I could see that actually you could you could play the guitar. So you know, you could play music uh, as a job. Hmm. And I, I saw that first of all, and then from from that moment, from the age of eight. And and I can remember saying to my my dad, your grandfather, saying to me, he said, "You don't like school, do you?" And I, and I said, "No." He said, "Well, just just do what you need to do." He said, and then because you know you're gonna you're gonna be a musician, I can see that. So I was very fortunate uh, with that. I mean, my mother was you know she she didn't <laughs> she didn't like, think too much of that. She didn't want me to do that, but there you go. Uh, but, so, but you're, you're known now it also as as well as being a being a player, being a a teacher as well, a teacher of this, you know, this a certain kind of style, your kind of style, yeah. your finger style player. But so, how do you work with students who maybe they don't feel that they necessarily have that like a natural talent in what they're doing? They they, they really have to work at it. How do you how, how do you work with that student to kind of bring bring that thing out of them? Well, even if you've got a natural talent for something, uh, and in my case, my natural talent was with music. You still, it's still most of it is still work. Uh, because you know, I've known musicians that have, well, not, not, not obviously not professional musicians. I've known musicians, people that play music, um, and are very, very natural. They have a, a, a real aptitude for it, but never put the work in. Hmm. 
Uh, and then, then I've seen other musicians that have become successful as musicians and done very well and created some fantastic music um, who didn't have that natural ability but had to work really hard hard at it. So it, it's not just this thing that you – I think – a lot of people, they'll see somebody like me and they know that I've been playing since I was very young and they say, well, that's a, you know, you're a natural, you know, yeah. because they, they must think that I played like this when I was eight years old. I didn't play like this when I was 50. You know, I'm, now I, you know, I get, uh, I'm working at it all the time. I play better now than I did 10 years ago. So, um, a lot of it is to do with work, but also it's about getting getting my students to look at music from an angle that makes sense uh, of actually how uh, how it's made up. Like you get a lot of guitar players now um, because of the internet. It's, it's an amazing thing. It's great. You know, they can, they can say, well, I, I want to learn this guitar solo that I heard somebody do. So they go on the internet and they get the tab hmm. of it. So they, they got the, 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 the tablature music of it. So which, tells them where they put their fingers. So they learn how to play it that way, but they have no idea about what they're playing. It's not only that. I mean, I've known a lot of classical guitar players that are the same. They just, they kind of know, they know where to put their fingers. They don't know how the music that they're playing is constructed. Obviously, they're not all like this, but uh, I've, I have met many uh, like that. So I, the first thing I do is I get my students to sing and um Making that connection between, you know, I say the music doesn't come from the guitar. That's, you know, I always describe the guitar as the loudspeaker of my mind. This is the way I can express for everyone to listen to the, the, a little bit of what, the, you know, of the music that's going on in my head. So we have to find uh, from the ideas that you have in your mind um, to getting to the instrument. Um, a lot of the time there's a total communication breakdown and it can't get to the instrument. So I use singing as a bridge. I say, if you can think it, if you can sing it, and then when you learn to sing it, then you play the guitar, you play along with your singing, then you drop the singing, you've made your made your connection. Mm. And um, a lot of it's to do with, with ear training. Just very, very simple things. The, the, the last three guitar retreats that I did, I did two in Italy and one in New York, I got some of the guitar players there. Many of them have been playing for years, years and years. They were very good players. And I just got them to do these very easy exercises, playing little nursery rhymes or, or just you know singing them and then playing them, playing a little s simple melody, uh, uh, sorry, singing a simple melody and saying, now play that. And they thought, uh, first of all, they thought, you know, why are we doing this? Mm. And then they realized they couldn't do it. Yeah. And one of the biggest thrills I got was at the end of the, the, the last retreat, I said, right, let's, let's all... Let's end the the guitar retreat as we began it. Just play. Let's all play a blues in G. And one of the guys in particular, he started play. He started singing and playing along to his singing. And it was this guy was seventy years of age, and he'd been playing guitar for a long time. And when he was playing, it looked like a kid that had that look on his face as he was doing it is like a kid that for the first time is riding a bicycle without stabilizers on. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I can ride a bike. Wow, I can keep going, or I can swim, and it was an amazing thing to see. I think. Uh, I think the other thing. I mean, I, I've come along to a couple of these these retreats now, and the, the thing I found really, uh, I thought it was very very touching, was seeing um, seeing some of these players who this was possibly because I know at the end of these retreats they have like this public concerts and, and people actually the students actually get a chance to play in, in public and in one way or the other but seeing some of these students who this is this has probably been the first time they've, they've played in public certainly played in public to people that aren't family members and close friends and things and seeing that sense of achievement on their faces and then it's been even more incredible when you see people members of the public then come up to them after the performance and actually say I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the way that you played that, you know, and it's just, it's, it's, it's a very beautiful thing to see that when, when you, you see someone that initially comes onto a, whether it's a course or, or a kind of training yeah. event like that. And, you know, everyone's a little bit worried. I'm at the right level. Can, can I play this? And, you know, am, am I going to make a fool of myself? And then gradually bit by bit, they get the more confidence. And at the end for them to see them actually on stage playing in front of people, and, and and kind of losing themselves in, in in the moment, and then being having people come up and saying that was great. I really enjoyed that. That's that's incredible. 
Yeah, you because know, that's what it's about. That's yeah. the end result. That's where you want to be. Yeah. Um, and I remember at the, the New York retreat, there was, if, if you remember, there was a guy from flew in from Tokyo. That's right. Yeah. And, and he had, he understood, he, he understood English. He wasn't fluent in speaking English, but he, he could, he, he followed the, the lessons well. And if, if there's something he didn't get, he, he would ask me. But I remember the first night he got up and played, he sang a song in English and played beautiful guitar. Now, I'm, I thought, put it the other way around. Say I went to Japan. I was in a, a room full of uh, Japanese people. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I had to get up, play a tune on the shamisen and sing a song in Japanese. You know, I mean, that was, that was fantastic. And the thrill he got, because he, he did it so well. Yeah. And it wasn't everybody just being, you know, oh yeah, well done, you know. That's, you know it, it was he. It was brilliant what he did. Yeah. And you know, we've seen that at, at so many in Italy. We had an open air concert in the in the town square, and many had never ever played before. And even those that were very nervous about it and made some mistakes and had to stop and start again, it didn't matter. It, it didn't matter at all. It was um, also I. I I then was able to, in the, the next day, teach them some tricks about uh, things that you can do so that you, if you make a mistake, you don't have to stop. You can just keep going. And so it was actually, it was actually very good for me. It gave me some, uh, um, some ideas for, for, for teaching. Because I, when, I, when I was actually watching, watching all the students play, it, then I, I would listen without my musician's ears on and then every so often put the musician's ears on again and then I would say, I would think to myself, yeah, do you know what would be good? What they need to do is this. And then the next day I could then then, then work on an idea for them. And the biggest thrill I get is when I see students take on the ideas that I'm giving them and put them into practice. And you hear the just, just little tiny things um, that make a difference. When I first started to, to teach on, online with the interactive school, I, I thought, well, I don't know whether I'm going to be any good at this. And then for a while I didn't even know whether I wasn't sure whether I was any good at it, but then I started noticing that um, everyone was playing better. Yeah. So yeah. I thought, well, I must be doing something right because I, I, I never had any lessons myself. You see, so I didn't even know how to teach. I'd never been to a guitar lesson. And then, what, what do you do? You know, what 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 do you need to know? So I I actually had to analyze my own playing, and figure out what I was doing because I'd never thought about it before. But it was it, it was it's very interesting both in the online side and also uh, you know whether it's guitar you know music camps music retreats uh, however you you want to call them that um, you'll often find people there that that are going to that event especially around um, big birthdays um, or maybe they, they, they've they've decided this is what they, they, they're going to get back to playing guitar they're going to get back to playing music or it might be around either I often find it happens a lot around people's big birthdays or maybe they lose a close family member and they suddenly think, oh, okay, I need to actually get back to what's important. And someone said to me the other day, I was talking to someone the, the, the other day about it, and they, they said, that, well, you, said, you have to remember that when we're three or four, we get given crayons and we completely lose ourselves in you know, sitting there with crayons, creating these imaginary kingdoms and houses and all that kind of stuff and losing ourselves in the paper with, and what we're creating, the art that we're creating. And then when we get to age 11 or 12, suddenly our crayons are taken off of us and we're given books on algebra and Roman history. And then it comes to a point in your life where you kind of say, I want my crayons back. I want that thing back in my life that that I got pleasure, that I got joy from. And some, some people that's playing guitar, other people it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's doing some other form of like painting or some other sort of form of self-expression, but it's, it's very kind of deeply hardwired in, our, in us as human beings. It is. That's why the arts are, are so important to it. It's, it's what really defines us. I think that really defines us as, as, as human beings and, uh, of cultures and, um, every, every culture, uh, has, uh, has art, uh, has has music, has has painting, has has th th these ways of expression. And the interesting thing is, if you, um, so you, know, you get, I don't want to get into a political rant here, but you know, so many politicians say, "Oh well, we've got to make cuts. We'll cut out the music. We'll cut out the arts. We, you know, but they're just a bunch of ponces, <laughs> arty farty people." Uh, we won't give them their, their money. But actually, if you if you look at history, and I've always been interested in. In, in history, um, it seems to be the, 
the artists, the musicians, the poets, the philosophers that are remembered. Mm. No one remembers accountants. No. Or, <laughs> no. Um, and uh, apologies if you're if you're an accountant listening to this just now. We've suddenly broken your heart. Uh, we we apologise, but it's probably worth starting to <laughs> create some art again. So, what what's some of the best advice that you've you've received in in music? The best <coughs> the best piece of advice I ever received was from my father, from your grandfather. Um, I was playing. Um, um, you'd just been born, so that's um, thirty eight years ago. And I'd taken a job. I was playing at the Dorchester Hotel on Park Lane in London, doing a job that I really hated, playing in the restaurant there. And it was really soul-destroying. And I thought, you know, I didn't take up music to do this. And it really, I, I started to actually feel quite unwell from, from doing it. I didn't feel like getting up in the morning and I would just go and do, do the gig six nights a week. And nobody listened to us. Even the band, they, they were musicians that had been doing that kind of work for years. They weren't interested in music at all. It was just a job to them. And, um, and I remember saying to my dad, I, was, I, I don't think I, 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 you know, I hate this job. He said, well, pack it in. Don't do it. And I just got married and you were just born. And, and I said, I said yeah, but the, the, uh, the trouble is, what about the money? And he said to me, Never do anything just for the money. Yeah. Now, there have been times in my life when um, I think if someone had said that to me, I'd have probably punched them. <laughs> when I've been down and out, really, really broke, really skinned, uh, where I didn't, you know, that wouldn't have gone down very well. But I, th I did that, actually, because I, uh, there were times when it was, it was very, very difficult. You know, I had some very, uh, very lean times in the early years, and not even so, so early years. And uh, there were things that I said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that because um, I will only be doing that for the money. And it's, there's something I can find something else to do. So I, I would that that's really that's that's the best advice I think I had. Mm. It wasn't easy at times, but it it was it was the best advice because I meet a lot of a lot of musicians. In fact, I, I had a. a uh, a guy contacted me. I went to school with him, but I haven't seen him since I was 15. And because I left school at 15, playing in a band, and he was interested in music. And he, a few years ago, he contacted me and he said, "You know, I, uh, you went and did music, and I thought you were mad doing that." You know, so, but you know, uh, I realise now that that's what I should have done. Mm. And so, can you give me some advice? You know, to getting in a band and all that. And I said, "Look, you're 55, and you want to become a rock star all of a sudden. You know, this is this is crazy. You know, you you left it." You left it too late to do that. You haven't left it too late to play music, but to suddenly think you're, you know, he saw where where I was, but he didn't. He didn't seem to realise I've been doing that since I was since I was fifteen. Yeah, all the work that was involved. Uh, so all the work that had been in, involved in in that, and uh, you know, I'm sorry for him that he he feels that he he, uh, he made a bad decision. You know, we we all make bad bad decisions in in our lives, but uh, it it isn't it isn't really isn't that that straightforward and i one thing i can i can say that i've i've um i've always kept pretty true to what i do and uh, i've i've never um, in the early days i i was i played music i didn't really want to play but it didn't matter because i i just wanted to be a professional musician i just wanted to earn my living playing music so i went and played at holiday camps i went and played on cruise ships and i loved it because I was a musician, I didn't like the music particularly, and I knew, well, I'm not going to do this this forever. But uh, when it came to a point, I said, well, now it's time to move on. But at the time, in my the, the early days, I thought it was, I thought it was great. I got a lot of satisfaction. I used to get great satisfaction from from playing at weddings and bar mitzvahs and doing a really good job. You know, I would drive back after the gig and say, well, that was good. I, I did a I did a good job that gig. I played exactly what was needed for me. You know, that, that, that was. Um, very pleased with that. It was kind of workman, workman like. Yeah, it's kind of uh, like learning, learning your craft. Yeah, it was. It was exactly that. It's 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 like um, yeah, by being a being a carpenter and making a piece of furniture that you wasn't really what you wanted to do, and you wanted had aspirations to to make things a lot better. But you look at it and say, yeah, I did a good job there. Yeah. That's very good. It's so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's functional. 
Is there a, an online resor- uh, kind of resource or a tool or uh, that, that you that you actually like? Cause I know you're, you're, you're famous. You're, you're not a big fan of technology per se, which is interesting considering you've you've probably got <laughs> the, one of the most successful online uh, guitar schools. But are there any tools that you do like? Any online tools or mobile things on on your on your on your phone that you tend to to use and you enjoy? Well, in the studio, I use I use Spotify. And I use uh, YouTube, and I just find that it's just fantastic for for me to get ideas and um, to inspire me. Sometimes, sometimes I'll come into here into my studio, and I'll just do a search, and I'll I'll, I'll just think of somebody uh, of a musician and put something on. And I'll, I'll listen to them uh, for a while. One thing I, I I never do, I never listen to music. I never have music on as background. I only put music on if I'm going to sit and listen to it and get totally into it music is isn't a background thing for me so this is the, this my studio is the only place in my house where i actually listen to music yeah and i, I come in and I, and I usually go on to spotify i've got all my old vinyl here as well because i've been listening to, to some of that going down memory lane um but yeah and actually i i use youtube as well a lot for my students because um sometimes a student will send me a video of them playing and and I can see what they're trying to do and I think wow they they would really benefit from hearing the way Bill Evans played this or or the way Scotty Moore played a guitar solo on a, on an Elvis tune or something they're just something I think and I just go on onto YouTube and I find that and I send them the link and I say check this out and here's this is the reason why mm-hmm. Uh, and this is what I want you to look, look out for. So I think I think it's quite amazing. Uh, things that took me ten years to learn when I started playing, when we didn't have any of this at all, um, it took me ten years to learn. You you can learn it in 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 like eighteen months. You know, I've well, that, um, that's what they say about so many of the, the young, your young students coming to college now. Technically, they're so much better than the previous oh, yeah. years have been coming because they've been able to compress so much information and be exposed to so many different types of players at such a um, you know an early age. Which kind of brings me on to my next question: is if you could recommend a, a, you know either a recording or or and a, a book to our listeners, what would it be? Well, well, I listen a lot to singers actually. Um, over the years, one of the reasons my guitar playing, if you hear a guitar player playing, you can usually tell who their influences are straight away. Straight away. Um, you can hear them in there. Uh, the reason mine, mine aren't so obvious is because I was influenced mostly by piano players and saxophone players and then later on singers. Mm. Um, so it, it's not so obvious. I try to, what I do mostly when I play solo guitar is emulating the way a piano player would play left hand and, and right hand of the piano. Uh, so I, singers have become very important for me to, to do with phrasing. There's, I'll, I'll get to your question in a <laughs> the answer to your question in a moment. Um, there are three things that I, I have to work with my, all my students. Just about, I would say, ninety percent of my, my students have these the, the three pro, three problems: uh, is keeping in time, um, keeping the form of the tune, not adding bars, adding notes, or dropping dropping things. Just keeping the form, and also getting everything to flow. And certainly with the last part there, I, I get them to listen to singers. I say, well, a singer wouldn't sing that melody like that because it would be disjointed. Mm-hmm. And I get great results from that by pointing them in the direction of singers. And they listen to the way they sing that. Now, you play, you play along to them singing that and start to em- emulate their phrasing. So I would say, uh, f- for me, something that I can, for the kind of music that I, that I play as well and what I'm trying to do is <coughs> music that I heard a lot as a, as a child uh, with my mother's record collection was, was Frank Sinatra, Tony Bennett, and um, Nat King Cole, and not just their singing, but also the orchestral arrangements of, of um, some of those great uh, um, or, uh, orchestral uh, orchestrators and, and arrangers. Nelson so, Riddles and yeah, Nelson Riddle, um, uh, Billy May, um, Robert Farnan. Two two out of those three I worked with. I didn't work with Billy May, uh, but. Um, yeah, that that really inspired me harmonically 
And as far as the phrasing and uh, melodic side, that really came from singers. So I would say you can. It doesn't matter what kind of music you play. You can you can earn, you can learn an awful lot by listening to some of those recordings of Frank Sinatra. Is there is there a specific recording that people should check out? Either you know the one these the Nelson Riddle and Sinatra albums or Tony well, Bennett. Yeah, I, I think uh, Frank Sinatra's "Come Fly with Me" mm-hmm. is is pretty amazing. Just hearing him sing on that, how he phrases everything, how he interprets the music, listening to the 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 orchestrations, the the, the colors and textures that uh, you you hear within the big band and and the orchestra, that can all be transferred onto whatever kind of music you you play. You know, there's there's nothing new in music. It all it's all been done before. So let's imagine if you woke up tomorrow, you had to start from scratch. So you had the guitar, and you've had the the, the knowledge and experience that you've acquired over the the years in music. What would you do? <laughs> well, um, I don't know whether I would actually play the guitar again. Uh, I don't know whether I would take a musical path. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I'm a great believer that um, things move on and everything kind of has its has its time, has its life, and um, uh, you know, with maybe my my musical life will be kind of played out and then I move on to something else. But when I started playing music, uh, I you know I heard recordings. Uh, my dad played a little bit of guitar and played double bass, and friends used to come round and play music. And I, the way I learned was listening to records, just trying to copy it, um, developing my ear so that I could copy what I was hearing and then just play around with it and do my own thing with it. And also hearing other people playing guitar. My next door neighbor was Jippy Mayo, who uh, went on to play with uh, Dr. Feelgood, guitar player with Dr. Feelgood. And we started playing guitar at the same time. My dad showed both of us our, our first chords and he went into a, a different um, musical direction but he knew a bit more than me and I knew another guitar player that knew a bit more and a bit more so I just I just learned that way and also because we didn't have the res- resource of Spotify and and YouTube it was very limited what we got to hear fortunately a friend of my dad's um, was was a jazz musician and blues musician and he worked with with Chris Barber and he worked with a lot of American musicians came over he worked a lot with um, he toured around Europe with uh, Big Bill Brunzi his name was Dick Bishop and um, so I, he used to bring records in. So I used to hear more music than most of my friends heard. So I had a, a wider range of music. They were only listening to whatever they, they got on the, uh, on the BBC radio. Um, but now I, I, don't, I, I think really it, it could be quite over, overwhelming probably. There's so, there's so much to hear. There's so much to, to explore. How, yeah. do you, how do you find a – I think where yeah. would you start? Yes, it's a little bit like I was talking with someone yesterday. We were talking about curation now, where you know, in a gallery, you could, you could, in theory, you could put anything on the walls, but it's actually what you leave off that's sometimes more, more important. So, well, thank you for, for coming on on the show. Before we finish up, share the best way that listeners can connect with you and and learn more about you and your music. Well, the best way to connect with me is to go to my website martintaylor.com, and that will. Once you're there, that's kind of that's kind of my home. Um, you can uh, you can sign up for my uh, e newsletter and uh, which which goes out on a fairly regular basis, um, letting you know where I'm playing, my tour dates. Um, from time to time, I I and I'm doing this more often now. I I film things here in my studio. Um, sometimes where I'm playing, sometimes where I'm teaching, sometimes where I'm just talking about aspects of music. Um, yeah, kind of everything's there. There's information about uh, my guitar school, guitar retreats, my guitars. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of the place. My discography, biography, um, some some wonderful photographs of me from over the years. If you want to have a look at some of those. <laughs> well, th- thank you. I know it's, this has been an, an unusual one. It's a fa- yeah, fa- it father and son. I think it's the first time. The first time I've, I've done all this. Is, is thank you very much for being so open and coming coming on the show and uh talking about your your life your life in in music as well and uh and i'll sh- i shall see you very soon i would imagine yep i hope so <laughs> okay thanks <laughs> thank you see you, see you. bye hey james taylor here again 
And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.